Did a homeless man get help from a good Samaritan, or is he a singular victim of the Mandela effect? And then we travel to a recording studio where a young man feverishly writes out lyrics to his newest album. But these lyrics aren't coming from a creative mind. They're coming from the Book of the Dead, today on Dead Rabbit Radio. Hey everyone, welcome back to another episode of Dead Rabbit Radio. I'm your host, Jason Carpenter. I'm having a great day. I hope you guys are having a great day too. We got a ton of stuff to cover, so we're going to get started right away. First off, walking into Dead Rabbit Command right now, everyone give it up for one of our Christmas live stream contributors, Kamau Kokai Taylor. Woohoo, yeah, come on in, come on in, Kamau. Kamau, I don't even know if these people still even listen to the show, right? They donated money back in December, but... Come out, you're going to be our captain, our pilot this episode. If you guys can't support the Patreon or live stream, I totally understand. Just help spread the word about the show. That helps out so much. Come out, let's go ahead and toss you the bunny bicycle. Uh, we'll hop on the handlebars as you pedal us all the way out to Colorado Springs, Colorado. <sighs> I gotta come up with a better special effect than that. People are like, what? Is my dog, is my dog panting near my leg? Kamau's pedaling us all the way out to Colorado Springs, Colorado. This is a really recent paranormal conspiracy story. This all started back in June of 2022. This guy posted this story online. He went by the name Revolutionary25485. I don't have his actual real name. We're going to call him Cody. That'll be his name for this story. And Cody is currently a homeless dude living in his car. And he's like, you know, it kind of sucks not having a house and all that stuff. But luckily the weather's warm enough. I can just sit in my car, kick back. I don't know if he has a job. (laughs) Well, okay, let's put it this way. I did go through his posting history. He's up to something, but we don't know what this guy's situation is. All we know is that he's homeless and he lives in his car. And he says this, he, he, he cannot explain what happened. And I can't either. This is absolutely fascinating. He said that his car has heavy oxidation on the car headlights. And the passenger quarter panel, which is that piece of like fiberglass or metal or whatever it's made out of, that goes from the headlight all the way to the passenger door. It's like this big panel. I had to look it up. If you guys were like, Jason, we know what a quarter panel is. I was like, huh? I had to look it up. That big piece of plastic or fiberglass, whatever it's made out of, steel that goes from the passenger side door to the headlight on the passenger side, was covered in a good layer of dirt. Dirty car, dirty headlights. I don't know what the state of the rest of the car was. I don't know if just that part was muddy. I don't know what the state of the rest of the car was, but that these are the parts that are important to this story. And he's aware of this, right? We are, we're all pretty familiar with the bumps and scrapes and scratches of our cars. Well, one day... He's walking to his car, because even though he's homeless and living in his car, I'm sure he's, like, getting out to get food. I don't think he's cooking rotisserie chicken in the back seat. At one point, back in June, he's walking around his car, and he notices that the passenger side quarter panel is cleaned off completely. And not only is it cleaned off completely... It's brand new, just the quarter panel. And then he looks and he looks at his headlight and his driver's side headlight, heavy oxidation on it, passenger side headlight, brand new headlight. That whole area was replaced. And he has no idea what's happened to this. So what's interesting is when you look at the comments of people trying to help him, it it's, makes it very clear very quickly that nobody knows what could have caused this some people said well maybe maybe you were cooking a rotisserie chicken in your car they actually said maybe you were breathing in too much carbon monoxide because you left your car on all the time and because nobody knows where this guy's at i had to figure out that he was in colorado springs but he just said no the place i'm at is really warm right now so no and gas is five dollars a gallon so no i'm not running my car all the time so, because people are, all, you know, thinking maybe it's carbon monoxide because the post-it notes guy, that was an, that's a story about a guy who was 
slowly having carbon monoxide poisoning. He was leaving like weird post-it notes around his own house. And he thought his house was haunted because he'd find stuff out of place, but it was really him. Very famous story. It's something that it, people talk about all the time on ghost forums now. And someone's go, my, it was weird. My daughter began levitating around the room and vomiting. And people were like, well, uh, check out this uh, theory about carbon monoxide. Yeah, yeah. I don't think all ghost accounts could be for carbon monoxide. And then the idea of that in relation to this means this guy was up in fumes for so long he went to the pet boys bought a new quarter panel bought a new headlight didn't remember doing either installed them didn't remember doing either and then discovered them one day so i mean i guess you can hallucinate that (laughs) once you're at pet boys you're all thrown up everywhere they're like oh sir we'll help you just please stop hovering around you have that theory, right? Then, then, which, okay, fine. That's probably the best rational theory you can come up with. Then a bunch of people said this was, was just insane. They said, well, dude, maybe someone hit you with their car and felt really bad about it, but figured they don't want to get the insurance agents. This is a couple people actually said this. This is so stupid. They said maybe when you weren't in your car, because he's not in it 24-7, maybe when you weren't in the car, you, there was a car accident. Someone crashed into your car, and instead of leaving a note saying, sorry, I crashed into your car, here's my insurance information, instead of getting the insurance companies involved, instead of just doing a hit and run, which I think is what most people did, they replaced your front quarter panel and your head of light. They, they, they did it. When you weren't there, they straight up, they hit a car and they're like, oh no, let's not get the insurance involved. Luckily, I have this guy's exact car parts in the back seat of my car. And he's like, uh, I don't think it's, <laughs> he's been very more polite than I would have been. I was like, you guys are all idiots. He goes, I don't, I don't really think so. I don't know when they would have been able to replace everything. I do live in my car, like, even though I'm not in the car all the time. You think I would have just walked by when I saw two or three guys reinstalling parts of my car so he has no idea what could have caused this and he does mention the mandela effect as far as being part of this now obviously when we talk about these stories it could be totally made up it could oh god i would hate it if it's the start of some arg that i got tricked into but uh yeah that's the story we have what could have caused this like it definitely seems it's one of those paranormal stories that is so mundane i love it Right, it's so mundane. It's not like, and then he saw the three pet boys. Their ghosts are floating around. They're like, "We're sorry, you're homeless, homeless, homeless," and they fade away. And you know what I mean? Like, that actually would have been pretty rad. Now that I think about it, I do like extreme ghost stories as well. But um, it has to be one of the two. It has to be so insane that you can't believe it, or so mundane you think, "Why would someone lie about this?" Like. This is just one of those little mysteries, like who replaced his front quarter panel and his headlights. Brand new headlight, right? Brand new front quarter panel. So who knows? He brings up the Mandela effect. I mean, at a certain point, what would your options be? Mandela effect, uh, quantum death, right? He died in one reality and shifted (laughs) shifted into another reality. That's exactly the same. He's still homeless, but this time he has a new quarter panel and a new headlight. I mean, what could it be? I mean, I'm like, when we look at the lore, I can't think of anything else outside of those two, right? CERN firing up. We all went to the headlight universe this time instead of some big change. It's a little change like that. So I wanted to find out more about this guy. I always like to do this when I'm able to. I was looking through his posting history. He's only posted about two things. Technically three, but two, two or three things. The first one being his car. He posted about this a couple times. And then you can look at all this in the show notes. And then he posted on two other subreddits where he was trying to get laid. So, I mean, (laughs) I guess at least he has priorities in order, right? He's living on the streets. He's living in his car. The universe may be slowly repairing his vehicle. And then he's trying to have oral sex with some girl who goes by the name Unlucky Hedgehog. Dude, don't, don't don't roll the dice on that one. Do not roll the dice on that one. That's how I found out he was in Colorado Springs because he was commenting on subreddits for Colorado Springs, like Sexy Springers or something like that, or ColoradoSpringsHookups.com, wherever it was. 
Uh, that is where <laughs> that's where our intrepid Mandela adventurer is also spending his time. So be safe, be safe, young traveler. Um, and then with the car part, who knows what that could possibly be? Like, what? How could you explain that? If I had to guess a theory, I would say quantum death, right? Where you shift into another, you die, and then you shift into another universe that's almost unrecognizable from the one that you're in. But I don't even know if I'm a huge believer in that. I'm intrigued by the theory, but I don't know if I'm a huge believer in that. So who knows? It's truly a mystery what happened to this dude's car. And will it happen again? I'll keep, I'll keep looking at his posts. And they're watch, they just all be swing your posts from here on. I'm like, oh man, <laughs> I'm still checking. Blah. Kamal, let's go ahead and toss you the keys to the carpenter copter. We're leaving behind Colorado Springs, Colorado. We're gonna head all the way out to a recording studio. <laughs> I found this story the other day on the X board. There was a post about a band called the Mars Volta and a cursed album they were working on. And I actually have all the notes for that story as well. I had, a cho- I had to make a choice, though. I had to make a choice between doing a full segment on the Mars Volta cursed album. What was it called again? Like Walking Towards Goliath or um, Trouble in Goliath? Bedlam in Goliath was the name of that album. I right? read a bunch of articles about it and listened to a couple of their songs and r- wrote up a detailed thing about their cursed album, Bedlam in Goliath. But I've decided to tell this story instead. This story was posted in relation to that export post. Someone goes, you know what? Something like this happened to me, and they wrote this out. I had to choose between the two, and I figured the Mars Volta story, and who knows, maybe we'll cover it in the future. They're just so similar. They're just so similar. They're almost beat for beat, and I would rather cover the one that's more obscure. The Mars Volta one. If you're a fan of the Mars Volta, then you're probably familiar with this story. If you're not... I'll put some links in the show notes of this episode so you can research it. But the story I'm about to tell you has been told basically twice ever on the internet. The guy said, I talked about this a couple months ago, and I didn't, nobody really, nobody really cared, right? Nobody really cared. Who's this dude? And then he told the story again on this Mars Volta thread. So I wanted to cover this one, because this one, it will just disappear into the ether. The Mars Volta one is pretty well documented. Some people say it was just a publicity stunt. Who knows? This one I like because it's not a publicity stunt because we don't know any of the people. We don't know the name of the album. We don't even know where this story took place. But let's go ahead and get this story started. Maybe someday I'll, I'll do the Mars Volta. But again, it's almost beat for beat the same story because I would imagine if both stories are true, they would follow the same pattern or coming into contact with any sort of cursed media would probably follow along the same path. Let's get the story started here. Back in 1977, there was a book published called The Necromanon. It was originally a fiction... This, the, the, just a brief overview here. A lot of you guys may be familiar with this, but originally H.P. Lovecraft, as a narrative device in his stories, in his shared universe, the HPU, he created this book called the Necromanon that could be used to contact the Elder Gods. It had all these dark rituals that the followers of Cthulhu and Blackakaku and Yaxlakuka and all those dudes, right? Probably just summoned one or two. This is how you got a hold of them. This is basically their cell phone, the Necromanon. And he totally made it up. He's very, very clear. Yeah, I made it up. There's nothing to it. There is no real Necromanon. And H.P. Lovecraft for years, would be contacted by people asking where he got it or where they can get a copy, and he'd be like, it's fake, what are you talking about? So, of course, eventually someone's going to publish a book called The Necromanon. In 1977, there was a book called The Necromanon, and generally it's referred to as Simon Necromanon, because it was written by a, well, (laughs) this is supposed to be a brief overview, but again, I want to, I want to let you guys know how this book was crafted here. So there was a guy who supposedly was named Simon, who gathered up all of these spells and these rituals and found the Journal of the Mad Arab and put all this stuff together and published it as the Necromanon. But people are like, the Necromanon doesn't exist. But this supposedly was the real Necromanon. You can buy it at like a Barnes Noble or an Amazon. I got my copy at like a bookstore in the mall. 
Like, what were the... I don't even remember. Walden Books is where I, you could buy them anywhere, but it was supposed to be this dark book of the dead. These spells could actually summon the dark ones. I don't think Walden Books had anything legit like that, right? Well, what's interesting about this is it, it's been called a hoax because people go, we know the Necromonon doesn't exist. This book doesn't exist. H.P. Lovecraft made up the character of the Mad Arab, but you're saying you found... A journal of a fictional character that would be like finding the journal of R2-D2, right? It doesn't exist. And they believe that Simon was a fictional character. It was written by a guy named Peter Lavenda, who was an occult history author. And that he created Simon. He created this whole thing. Now, that's the... When I read it, I knew going... And I didn't read it. It was super boring. But when I bought it and read the first couple of pages, I knew that it was fictional. A lot of people who get it... I'd say most people who buy it know that it's fictional, but nowadays people go, here's the thing, with a lot of gri grimoires, these books of collections of spells, basically they are just collections of spells, right? And some might be real and some might be fake, and this is the tradition that there's always been. And so there are, there are some sources who say, yes, the Mad Arab is fake and Simon is fake. And a lot of the Necromonon, the book that you buy at the bookstore, is fake. However, some of the rituals are real. Because that is the ancient way of collecting these things. Do you think Peter actually sat down and made up ritual after ritual after ritual? Or did he just include some? There's been accounts of plagiarism and all sorts of stuff. But in general, the book is considered a work of fiction. So I wanted to be very clear on that because this fictional book is going to have some real life consequences. And what's really interesting is the people in this story also believe the book's fictional. For a while. Let's take a look at this story. This guy's name, we don't know it, right? He posted this anonymously on the X board. We're going to call him Philip. And he's at work, and his co-worker's reading a copy of the Necromonon. <laughs> I don't know where they're working, where you could just be in the break room, your feet up on a table, and you're like, oh, you need to sacrifice 11 men for the dagger of Tiamat. Oh, that's why that didn't work. I only sacrificed 10. He's reading the book. The co-worker's reading the book, the Necromonon, and Philip showed a little bit of interest. Oh, what are you reading over there, man? And they start talking about it. The co-worker goes, you want it? Which would probably be my, probably what I would say, too, because it was super boring. Here, you want it? Philip's like, yeah, sure, you know, I'll take it. And he starts reading over the next couple days, couple weeks. And he goes, you know, he's just reading it casually. It's fictional. He knows it's fictional, doesn't really take it seriously, but it's a fun read. It kind of takes you into this world where these things may exist. And he said, one day I was out reading it. There was a man, he walked by with his family. He goes, this guy was a total wasp man. <laughs> not, not like a big old bug one. He's like, oh no, I have some of the dark ones. Wasp is an old term. Just by him using the term wasp, I bet you this guy's as old as I am. It's white Anglo-Saxon Protestant. It was an old slang term for basically leave it to beaver type dudes, right? Very clean cut. Looks like they go to church twice a week. Wasps. I don't think they use that term anymore. I could be wrong. But anyways, he goes, this real waspy looking guy walked by. The man turns, looks at Phil and asks, Phil's reading this book. The man goes, so what are you reading? And there's something about the book caught his eye, right? And the and Philip goes, oh, the Necromonon. And that's when the man, he turned to his wife and his kid and says, hey, why don't you guys keep on walking? Why don't you guys just go somewhere? <laughs> go somewhere else. Go check on the millions of eggs you laid, honey. And so they walk away and he turns back to Phil and goes, hey, um, that book... That it's a very powerful book that you have. I want you to be aware of that. If you open yourself up to that book, bad things are going to happen. So just just be careful. And the man walks away. And that actually energized Phil. That made him want to read the book in a more serious fashion. Because again, it'd be like if someone walked up to you while you were reading The Hobbit and they go, hey... You better not go on a long journey anytime soon. A town might burn down. You'd be like, what? And then they walk away. It would be weird. You know that it's fictional, but here this guy is stopping and sending his family away so he can have this conversation with you. Very short conversation. So Phil decides to actually start taking the book more seriously. He decides to pretend that it's real. He begins practicing some of the rituals. 
he begins to what his friends could only describe as become obsessed with the Necromenon. And even he would use that term. I was obsessed with it. He finished the book and then he reread it and then he reread it again. And he's pretending that it's real. Like, what would happen if I actually believed any of this was real? He got lost in the words of the Necromenon. Now, there's a time jump in this story. He says there's a good period of time where he's kind of moved away from... He's no longer wearing the cloak to work. He's no longer burning candles in the break room. He's kind of past the stage where he was obsessed with the Necromenon. And one of his friends casually brings up one day, they go, hey, uh, dude, remember when you used to read that book all the time? (laughs) Phil's eyes turn red, the book, you call it simply a book. Phil goes, oh yeah, dude, the Necromenon, yeah, I used to read that all the time. And the friend goes, yeah, I remember you were acting really weird back then. I remember once you said you could talk to the stars. And he goes, it was it was weird because when he said, a good enough period of time passed because he goes, when my friend said that to me, it sounded super cringe. He goes, I had totally forgotten about that. That sounds like some cringy stuff that I would have said back then. But like when he said that, I was like, oh, that's super like edgelord. But at the same time, he 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 had forgotten that he said stuff like that. But once his friend said that, he goes, oh, dude, I do not only remember telling you that, I remember believing it. Like, I was really into the Necromenon, wasn't I? His friend's like, yeah, dude. (laughs) I'm glad that you can now be aware of that. It's kind of spooky. And around that same time, so this dude, he's a musician. He's like, plays guitar, he plays bass, plays piano, and he's a vocalist. He's kind of like all-in-one type of dude. And it sounded like he was either a musician before this and work. He had a lot of musician friends. I don't know if he was in a touring band or anything like that, or he just played on the weekends. But he goes, around the same time that my friend brought up this story about me saying I could talk to the stars, he goes, an album, an idea for an album popped in my head. I called up a buddy of mine who owns a studio and says, hey, man, do you mind if I get some studio time? I got a really cool idea for an album. It's like, yeah, sure, no problem, right? And he says he has a process when he is writing songs. But when he started writing these songs, the lyrics are just coming out of nowhere. He said he was writing songs quicker than he ever did. And when he would look back at the lyrics, he goes, these lyrics don't even make sense. It's like gibberish. He described the lyrics as both whimsical and bizarre. And he doesn't, even though he's writing them down, he doesn't really understand what they mean. And then when he's going into the studio, all of the songs have been written now. He goes in the studio, he goes, the arrangements completely fell into place. He goes, I've recorded albums before. I know how long these processes normally take. And this went incredibly fast. Like far quicker than he could have ever imagined. Everything was falling into place. And then, this is another detail that he didn't really remember at the time. That his friend had to, his friend who owned the studio had to tell him, like, dude, what in the world was going on back then? He said, apparently, that he kept insisting on having these small little details, these small little notes and noises inserted into the music. And the studio friend's like, uh, okay. And like he they would do a take and they'd put that little noise in. And the friend's like, you couldn't even hear it. Like you couldn't hear what was being added in. But Phil kept demanding to put in all these little strange, not like demonic growls or anything like that, but just like odd notes and noises laid into the track. And again, Phil didn't remember doing this stuff. This is something the friend mentioned after the album is completed. He goes, you were super insistent on having these little noises put in. And whenever I asked about him, whenever the friend of the studio owner asked about, so wait, 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 why are we putting that noise in then? Phil would get incredibly angry. Okay, sorry, I just was wondering, okay. The friend goes, you couldn't even hear that the noises and notes were in there, and I couldn't even ask about him. You'd flip out. Now, at this point, the album's near completion. They have these songs that feels like, dude, these songs are amazing. Let's start practicing to do a live show, right? We'll do a live show. We'll drop the album. It'll just be this big thing. Now, again, I don't think this was like a major 
label release. I don't even know if this was supposed to be a commercial release. This could have been an artistic release. They were only going to press like 100 albums. We're not for sure on the details like that. Like, was he a full-time musician? Was he a gig musician? Was this the album of the lifetime or just one of 50 albums he's done? We don't know all of those details, right? But we do know that he, Phil, is now getting together some of his friends. They're going to perform the album live. The night of the very first practice, Phil has his guitar on, the rest of the band's assembled. As they're practicing these songs, Phil screams out loud in pain. Everyone's totally freaking out. He screams out loud in pain, and he drops his guitar, and his guitar breaks when it hits the ground. And everyone's like, what in the world happened? And he turns around, he goes, somebody just scratched me. Something just scratched the hell out of my back and he turned around and he pulled his shirt up and sure enough, he has these huge scratches all over his back. Now, obviously, they weren't doing a live show yet. This wasn't a fan running up on stage scratching them. Totally freaked everyone out. Most of all, Phil, right? There's no one in there who could possibly scratch his back. They get weirded out by it. He gets weirded out by it. And they call quits the rehearsal. And also, he broke his guitar. He goes, I did not have the money for a new guitar. That makes me think he's more of like a gig musician, right? Because I know a lot of gig musicians and that happens. They got to wait a while. He goes, I couldn't get a new guitar. And I (laughs) also got scratched by some paranormal force. So we're not going to be doing a live show anytime soon. And the very next day, Phil gets a phone call from his friend at the studio. And in a very embarrassed tone, because the friend is a professional, right? The friend goes, hey, I don't know how to put this, but the album's gone. Phil's like, what are you talking about? He goes, they're they're gone. I'm looking at the hard drives. The files are gone. Everything we recorded is completely gone. And Phil feels a wave of depression kind of hit him, right? This is something he'd been worried. It was like his, again, he wasn't claiming this to be his masterpiece or that was going to be the album that defined him, but it was still something he worked on for a long period of time, right? And although he was having fun hanging out with his friends, stuff like that, it's hard work. And he felt really deflated. And at that point he goes, you know what? I I don't have the energy in it to, you know, re-record all that stuff. Whatever. And the friend's like, you sure? He's like, yeah, yeah. We're just going to drop it. We're not going to finish that album. He goes, around the same time, you know, I gave up on the album. He goes, at the same time, I moved. And he said, when we moved, my copy of the Necromonon went missing as well. And he goes, at that point, I'd really lost interest in it. Like, there was that time where I wasn't rereading it over and over again. But I was just done with it, right? Just done with it. And I think in, in the way that he has it set up, you know, he obviously doesn't think anything of the Necromonon, or he's casually interested in it, but it's a work of fiction. That guy inspires him, which is which was not what the dude wanted to do. He wanted him to be Carol. The guy inspired him to take it seriously. He begins to take it incredibly seriously, reading it, reading it, reading it, reading it, and starts saying cringy things and starts having weird beliefs that people around him are getting a little worried. And then it does seem like he's not so obsessed with it for a while, but the the mere mention of the book again inspires him to write this album, which I think the idea is it is still influenced by the Necromanon. It, the album, all of the ability to write these whimsical lyrics, but they were super bizarre. They didn't make sense. The album coming together so quickly, the insertion of these little sounds and signs. I think the push of the story is that that is also the Necromanon working through the album. He never really says, well, you know, I wrote, the lyrics about the Necromanon. I was taking rituals from the Necromanon and turning them into lyrics. But that is kind of implied, right? And from his point of view, it seems to be that that's how he sees it, right? The mere mention of his phase. What's interesting, in his narrative, he doesn't say, I was rereading the Necromanon over and over and over and over again up until the time I was recording it and I'm in the recording studio But I think the idea is that the recording process was influenced by the Necromanon. He had pushed himself too far, too fast in a fictional book, but turned it real. And the story's not over yet. I'm just doing a little bit of analysis right now, right? We still got a little twist ending. 
But the Necromenon influenced this album, and that's why it fit together so well. And he was doing stuff he didn't remember, right? It was very creepy. That's almost like a possession. But, so he moves on with his life, though. He's like, whatever, the Necromenon it inspired me to write this album, where at the very least was an underlying influence. But I lost it, and I lost interest in the album, and I'm gone. He finishes his story like this, though. This takes place a, a time afterwards, after he moved away and after the album disappeared. He says, quote, That friend with the studio actually died in a pretty brutal way. And it happened several years later when we got together again and decided to attempt the entire album again. Probably just a coincidence, but it left me feeling pretty messed up. It's a fascinating story, obviously, about cursed media, lost media. What was going on with this album? Was it truly inspired by a fictional book that elements of it may be true? Or is it the case of this young man who actually believed it was so true that he's connected a bunch of coincidences together, right? Things happen with technology, files disappear, people die, right? These are all things that happen, and is it possible that a narrative has been completed because it borders so close on the paranormal, he's putting together paranormal events? Or was it a real-life cursed album? Was this album actually influenced by demons? One thing I find really interesting is... Let's step back for a second and get kind of meta with this whole thing of spooky albums of cursed media. I've been thinking about the story a lot. If you if you haven't noticed, the audio's changed. I've been thinking about it. This is a couple days later I'm recording this part. Let's play this out for a second, because this is kind of the way that these stories go. Demon, <laughs> boy meets girl, demon meets the demon. Demon or demonically influenced music media, haunted recording, haunted movie is created. And yet, this media is almost always lost or destroyed. Demon meets a willing victim, right? A demon influences an artist to create the art, the artist created, and then the art becomes lost. It's how this story always plays out. Which, again, makes you think that not necessarily this guy's story is made up, but <laughs> every other story involving the same things are made up, right? Well, it, the album created by the Mars Volta, that got released and is actually critically acclaimed. But for the most part, right? And there are people who think the Mars Volta thing, that was just a marketing thing that they came up with. But for the most part, when we talk about movies like Babylon Rising or whatever it was that was supposedly haunted, it came out, nobody watched it. We hear these other albums that come out like this, guys. It doesn't get released. When we look at the history of these demonically created works of art, they seem to fall to the wayside. So my question is this. My question is this. Why? Why? Because if you were a demon and your goal was to create a piece of art, a haunted art, right? Cursed art. Anyone involved in the process of this, they're going to go mad or die, right? The idea is, is that if this piece of art got out, you know, it was deleted from the computer, it could never be recovered. And then when they talked about doing it again, the guy died, the studio dude died. So why? Why would a demon put so much work into an album and then curse it so much that it never gets created? So that that's my question. That's my question. Why? You think that now that they've had this willing victim craft this piece, wouldn't it have been in the demon's benefit to, I don't know, not kill the studio engineer or delete the files? Like, wouldn't it have been in that demon's benefit to have that album released? Whether or not it had 50 listeners or 50,000 listeners, it's still extra souls for the demon to corrupt. These weird sounds that are being laid underneath the audio track. People hearing those over and over and over again, that demonic influence is now coming to them with a snappy tune laid over it. 
why isn't the stuff being widely distributed? It's we talk. Or did I don't know? I've lost it. I've lost the order of episodes. I'm going to do an upcoming episode about the Illuminati's influence in the music business, right? And those get released, right? Yana's new album comes out. Charlie XCX's new album comes out. Has all this satanic Illuminati esque imagery in it. Those get released. Wouldn't it have been in the demons' best interest to get this album released? And if so. Why did they kill the engineer, if that's the story? You know, if, that, if that's the connection. Why did they kill the engineer? Why did they erase the files? That's what I don't understand about this story. Because the Mars Volta story, it's the same thing. They're influenced by this dark person known as Goliath. It's like three different personalities formed into one named Goliath. And he's dictating the album. Or this album is about what Goliath is saying through the use of this spirit board. But they keep running into problems too. The studio gets flooded. The files disappear off the computer. It's all of this stuff. The engineer at one point uh, takes all of his notes and says, you guys are going to unleash something dark upon the world and I don't want to have anything to do with it. So they had to start the process over from scratch. Why would the demons sabotage their own album? And I don't really have an answer for that. Like I said, I've been thinking about it for the past probably week. I'm adding this on way late in the game, and I just can't come up with an answer. Why would the demons create an album and then sabotage it? Or is the sabotage coming from a higher power? Is it not that the demons are deleting it from the computer? Is it God? Because he's like, uh -uh, uh -uh, I don't want that getting out there. But then it opens the question, then what about all the... This one had like little hidden audio tracks underneath a layer of music. You have music videos with straight-up satanic imagery. Those get released. I also don't know why why God would brutally kill the studio engineer, right? He could have just, I don't know, given him a flat tire on the way to the studio, and he goes, I don't want to record anymore. Anything, right? There's a lot of stuff in between getting them to not do the album again and brutally murdering somebody. So why? It doesn't seem like it's the most... The original ending was like dark and spooky like I normally do. It kind of was like, so the next so the next time you're recording a cursed album, watch out. One of those endings, but I thought more about it and I, I just don't understand the why of this story. I believe, I'll accept the belief that demons were a part of this recording process. That this guy went so deep into the world of darkness. That he started to believe that these spells were real and maybe some of them are. And he was putting them into the lyrics. I, I'll accept all that. And I accept that the files were getting deleted and you had this string of bad luck. I just don't understand why the demons would put so much work into an album and then sabotage it. And if they didn't, who did? But a fascinating story nonetheless. A story that ends not on a spooky ending, but on an open question. Why would this happen? What would the demons have to gain by creating an album and then deleting it? I guess the only way, I guess the only way to know is to craft a demonic album ourselves. Don't do that. Actually, probably shouldn't even joke about that. I do not understand it. But the world of the paranormal is not for me to understand all the time, right? That's why it's paranormal. That's why it doesn't it doesn't follow along the line of normal questions. Fascinating story nonetheless. DeadRabbitRadio at gmail.com is going to be your email address. You can also hit us up at facebook.com slash DeadRabbitRadio. TikTok is at DeadRabbitRadio. DeadRabbitRadio is the daily paranormal conspiracy and true crime podcast. You don't have to listen to it every day, but I'm glad you listened to it today. Have a great one.